obvious reasons. And so I'm so glad that that we're finally able to do this, even if I'm doing it from my uh, attic in Maryland, where there is significantly far inferior barbecue, um, I will say. So I'm I'm going to show you. Um, you should see my screen in just a second. Um, and you should see a cover of the book. And if you don't, um, Jessica or Shelly will let me know. Um, we'll pop in and let me know. But so my book is called Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe. And I think the title surprised a lot of people because one, we think that there aren't that many untold stories left. And the second part of that is America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe, I think surprises a lot of people who, who maybe believe that America made no effort to save the Jews of Europe. Um, there was an effort. America changed. American policy changed over time. And finally, in 1944, very late in the war, it became official U.S. policy to try to rescue Jews during the Holocaust. There was enough information out there that America made a really a very real effort um, to try to save people. So when I when I tell this story, which is kind of a complicated story, I always start on the first full weekend of August in 1942. Um, this is a picture, what I'm showing you now on my screen, of Roswell and Marjorie McClelland. Um, you can see Roswell, who went by Ross, uh, on the right of the screen. Um, at this point in time, he's 28 years old, and he is in southern France. Uh, he is a, an aid worker for the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers. Um, the Quakers had a really interesting relationship with Nazi Germany, the American Quakers, um, because they had run so many feeding programs in Germany after World War I, um, many Nazis remembered being fed by the Quakers as children. You know, Germany was devastated in World War I, there was a famine, and many Nazis had very positive associations with the work of the Quakers. And so when they began persecuting Jews, they actually, the Nazis allowed the American Quakers to stay in Germany to distribute aid, to help refugees, and that transmitted to Southern France. The American Quakers in Southern France were allowed into internment camps um, to distribute aid. And so you have a situation in August 1942, even after the US has entered the war, the American Quakers are still on the ground in Southern France inside internment camps. And the first full weekend of August, they're watching the deportations begin. The deportations of foreign Jews from Southern France north to Drancy, which is a camp outside of Paris. And from there, they're being sent to Auschwitz, where most of them are going to be killed upon arrival. And Ross knows what is about to happen to these people, these people that he's been working with. About a week before the deportations began, he had managed to get a meeting with Pierre Laval, who was the head of Nazi collaborating Southern France. And McClellan, who again is 28 years old, an American, pleaded with Laval and said, you have to cancel these deportations. You cannot let the Nazis take these people because he said, and, and this is from his notes at the time, the Nazis are going to exterminate these people. And Laval had laughed at him. He said that that is fiction, that's just a rumor. The Nazis are taking these people to special ethnic reservations um, in Poland where they will be well treated. And anyway, Laval said, if, if your country, if the United States cares so much about the fate of the Jews that you're pleading to me, why haven't you taken them? And so Rescue Board is really about how we got to there how U.S. immigration law was structured in the 1920s specifically to keep out specific kinds of immigrants, including Jews, people from Eastern and Southern Europe. Um, there was no refugee policy to speak of. America had no refugee policy until after World War II. So everyone who was trying to escape persecution is coming as an immigrant and through our very complex immigration system, which was meant to be slow and deliberate. It was not meant to deal with lots and lots of people who desperately need to escape. It's a story of how the United States in 1933, just as Hitler is taking power, has information. American citizens have information about what is happening. You can see this is the Kansas City Star, March 29th, 1933. And you can see that the biggest boldest headline is Nazi fury loose. Boycott against Jews spreads over Germany three days ahead of schedule. 
So you can see it's March 29th, 1933. The nationwide boycott against Jewish owned businesses in Germany won't happen until April 1st. But the readers of the Kansas City Star know in advance that this is going to happen and actually it's already started. That is the big headline, three weeks after Roosevelt takes office, right at the beginning of the New Deal, in the middle of the first 100 days, the big headline is Nazi Fury Loose, Difficult Day for Jews. And Americans who are reading this in 1933, reading about Jews being kicked out of the civil service, about the boycott of Jewish owned businesses, about the burning of books considered to be anti-Nazi, um, this is something that Americans are paying attention to and they're protesting. They're asking their government to do something about it, asking the US government, the, the new FDR administration, to protest on their behalf. So this is, um, this is a petition from March 28th, 1933 in St. Louis. It says there's a mass meeting of Protestants, Catholics, and Jews held at the Episcopal Cathedral in St. Louis to protest against the reported excesses committed against Jews in Germany. And they send a statement to the new Secretary of State. They said, it's not for us to interfere in the political affairs of the German nation, but there's no denying that this has to be reckoned with. And it is our duty to express our moral indignation regarding the reported excesses against the Jews of Germany. We condemn any manifestation of anti-Semitism anywhere. It is contrary to the ideals of humanity. The trouble is as, uh, that Americans really have a short attention span. We still do, right? Um, and it, in the spring of 1933, it, what the Nazis were doing was front page news, but it fades away by the summer. Um, other things take precedence. Um, the fact that we're in the middle of the Great Depression and 25% of the American workforce is unemployed, that becomes the big headline. And so Americans really stop paying attention to what is happening to German Jews. They pay attention again a few years later with Kristallnacht. Um, Kristallnacht is the longest and largest sustained newspaper coverage of any event related to the persecution of Jews. It is front page news in the United States for about three weeks. Um, I'm sorry I could only find the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I know it's on the other side of the state. Um, the Kansas City Star, for whatever reason, isn't digitized, but I know that it was front page news there too with the headline, Nazi hate burns, which is really interesting. Um, but you can see here that there's a lot going on November 10th, 1938, the day that Kristallnacht is happening. But this is the big headline, anti-Semitic mobs riot. Um, you can see that the president of modern Turkey has died, Pearl Buck wins the Nobel Prize, and it's the same week as the midterm elections. That's over there. The midterm elections are here, Kristallnacht is here. It is a much bigger story than the midterm elections for Americans the first week or the second week of November 1938. But this outrage that Americans feel and that they're reading about, and photos come within days of what's happening with Kristallnacht, the attack on Jewish owned shops, on synagogues, the arrest of 30,000 Jewish men and boys. Americans are reading about that but they don't necessarily think it's their problem. So there's a Gallup poll taken right after Kristallnacht. This is about three weeks later. Um, and these are the same people being asked this question. Do you approve or disapprove of the Nazi treatment of Jews in Germany? 94% of Americans say that they disapprove. And then people are asked, should we allow a larger number of Jewish exiles to come to the United States to live? and more than 70% of Americans say no. So this gap between disapproving of what the Nazis are doing and being willing to be part of that solution kind of goes over this whole history. Um, there's always this kind of thoughts and prayers sent to Jews in Germany. We are not willing to get involved. Um, our, the American people and the government are so kind of anti-immigrant at this point that in April, 1938, um, a group of Jewish congressmen get together and they decide amongst themselves that none of them are going to introduce any new immigration legislation. That the issue of raising the number of people who can come here is so toxic that if they even have the debate, it will only result in lowering the number of people who can come. And so it was better to just keep quiet and try to keep the numbers as they are rather than talk about making it larger. Um, of course, even though we don't change our immigration numbers, there are hundreds of thousands of people applying 
to immigrate to the United States. This refugee crisis expands past Pearl Harbor um, as Jews who are still in southern France, who are in Casablanca, who are in Lisbon, are still desperately trying to get out. And so it becomes a story of how you can have, in August 1942, an American watching deportations from inside a concentration camp. Um, really, though, my story is about what happens next, because Roswell McClellan is not the only person working that first full weekend of August 1942. Um, Gerhard Rigner, who was the Secretary of the World Jewish Congress in Switzerland, has just learned third hand from a German businessman that the Nazis have a plan, that all of the reports that they were hearing back in the United States of deportations or mass shootings, it all had a point. And the point was that the Nazis were trying to exterminate the Jews. They were trying to round them up, send them to the east. And as you can see at the end of this, at one blow, exterminated to resolve once and for all the Jewish question in Europe. This seems really obvious to us now. It's, it's really difficult, I think, for us to look back and not recognize the Holocaust for what it was. But for a lot of Americans, this is really stunning information. Um, it didn't make sense to them. This idea that the Nazis would be diverting resources from trying to win a war to trying to eliminate an enemy that they've made up in their heads. It didn't make sense to most Americans. And so they thought, well, this is just propaganda. This is just people wanting us to fight harder because they're talking about how terrible our enemy is, how terrible the Nazis are. There's no way that they're that bad. They just want us to join the war. Um, and so it takes a long time for Americans to believe that this is happening. So Rigner takes this information and he tries to send it through the US State Department in Switzerland to Stephen Wise. Um, Stephen Wise the, was the most famous rabbi in America. He was somebody who knew President Roosevelt. And Rigner thought, well, if Wise knows that the Nazis have this plan, Wise will go to Roosevelt and the two of them will come up with something. They will figure out how to fix this. They will figure out how to rescue people. Um, the State Department in Washington blocks this message. They don't deliver it to Wise. Um, they say that it's just a war rumor and it's, it's, there's no sense in riling people up. Um, you can see on your screen that, that Rigner figures this out, figures out that the State Department is blocking this information. And so he sends it to Wise via, or he gets it to England and England gets it to Wise via Western Union. Like a regular telegram, this information comes to the US. Um, by November, it is public. This information is public. The State Department finally confirmed that it was happening. And throughout um, November, Americans are reading about this. Uh, they read that Wise says 2 million Jews have already been slain, that Wise says that the State Department has already confirmed this. And by December uh, 1942, there's enough information that the State Department needs to make, the U.S. needs to make some sort of statement about this. Um, the, the State Department and the British Foreign Office and the Soviet Union, they decide there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do to rescue people. So we're going to issue a statement. They issue a joint declaration saying, we condemn what is happening. Um, it is cold-blooded extermination and we promise that we will have war crimes trials after the war. They don't promise any sort of rescue action. Instead, they promise we will just have war crimes trials after the war. Part of the challenge in all of this is that November 1942, the exact moment that Americans find out that, um, that the Holocaust is happening, find out that there's this Nazi plan to murder all the Jews of Europe, that's the same month that the Allies land in North Africa. So American troops, British troops, Canadian troops are thousands of miles away from the death camps where most people are being murdered. Um, and so there is to some extent, this idea that we can't mass rescue the Jews. But there is a lot more that we could have done. 1943 is really a lost year. Um, the US finds out more and more and more about what is happening. There's more pressure on the US government to do something about it. Um, there is a pageant that, that tours the country um, called We Will Never Die that, that mourns the murdered Jews of Europe. Um, there's an Orthodox rabbi's march on the, on the U.S. Capitol in October 1944, or I'm sorry, October 1943, demanding some sort of rescue action. 
nobody's quite sure what that would look like um, or what was possible, but the US government doesn't really look to see what was possible. They just say nothing is possible, so we're not even going to look into it. Um, and so the rabbis aren't sure what to ask for, but they demand something, like at least try to rescue people. Um, at this point in the story, the Treasury Department gets involved, a group of Treasury Department lawyers, most of them in their 30s, very unlikely heroes of a story. Um, they had spent the fall of 1943 getting increasingly frustrated with the State Department, with the State Department saying there's nothing that can be done, with the State Department delaying relief, um, financial relief that non uh, nonprofits like the Joint or like the World Jewish Congress that they're trying to send into Europe. Um, one Treasury Department employee manages to sneak into the State Department in December 1943. And what he discovers in their file room is that not only has the State Department been deliberately delaying their approval of humanitarian aid to Jews, but um, an Assistant Secretary of State had personally instructed the U.S. legation in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States, that that information was getting out to activists and those activists were de were demanding some sort of rescue action. And so if Americans don't know about what's happening, if they don't know more about the Holocaust, they won't put pressure on the US government to do anything about it. One of the best things about studying the Treasury Department at this time is that Henry Morgenthau Jr. was the US Treasury Secretary. He was a personal friend of Roosevelt's. He lived not far from Hyde Park in New York. Um, he was not a financial guy, which you would expect in a treasury secretary. He wasn't good at that, um, but he was a really good manager um, and a, a fantastic record keeper. And you can go online now and, and look at transcripts, full transcripts of his meetings, really starting in 1934 when he became treasury secretary all the way to 1945, um, the summer of 1945 when he resigned. Um, and so you can see his conversations. You can see how the Treasury staff reacts to this information that they're finding from the State Department. And in one conversation in December 1943, Josiah Du Bois, who was the Treasury Department person who sneaks into the State Department, he says, Mr. Secretary, the only question we have in our mind, I think, is the bull has to be taken by the horns in dealing with this Jewish issue and get this thing out of the State Department into some agency's hands that's willing to deal with it frontally. For instance, take the complaint, what are we going to do with the Jews? We let them die because we don't know what to do with them. And then Randolph Paul, who was the Treasury Department's general counsel, said, we are speaking as citizens now. And, and I always found that really powerful, this idea that the Treasury Department staff are going to the secretary and saying, this isn't a policy thing, this isn't something that politically we think is a good idea necessarily. We are coming to you as American citizens. And we think that our country is better than what the State Department is doing. We think we should be doing something different. So armed with all of this evidence that they've collected against the State Department, the Treasury Department writes a memo. This is one of the early drafts of the memo. You can see it's called Personal Report to the President on the Acquiescence of This Government in the Murder of the Jewish Population of Europe. That is not, by the way, the title of most government memos. Um, this is how it begins. One of the greatest crimes in history, the slaughter of the Jewish people in Europe is continuing unabated. And then it says a few paragraphs get down. Unless remedial steps of a drastic nature are taken and taken immediately, I am certain that no effective action will be taken by this government to prevent the complete extermination of the Jews in German controlled Europe. And that this government will have to share for all time responsibility for this extermination. So the Treasury staff convinces Morgenthau it's not worth dealing with the State Department anymore. We have to go to the president. And they meet with um, Roosevelt on January 16th, 1944. And they convince him that it is time to take this away from the State Department, to create a new government agency called the War Refugee Board, which will now be in charge of all matters related to so-called refugees, which is basically the Jews of Europe. Um, it's officially headed this new government agency by the secretaries of war, state, and treasury, but it is almost completely a treasury department operation. Um, it is housed at the treasury department. That's where their offices are. Henry Morgenthau stays involved in day-to-day -day operations. 
And the head of the War Refugee Board is John Paley, who was um, a 35-year-old assistant to the secretary who was raised in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, he had been the head of the U.S. sanctions program in charges of protecting, in 1944, $8 billion of, of things that we had seized from Nazi Germany and from the areas that the Nazis controlled just to make sure that it didn't fall into the hands of the enemy. And so he had a very real job um, and has moved over to become the head of this new organization. Um, so for the first time in, in January 1944, the U.S. has a policy about the Holocaust. Um, it is a policy of relief and rescue. And by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board has saved, they estimate, tens of thousands of lives. So my book is, is the first non-self-published book about the War Refugee Board, which was really surprising to me because there are hundreds if not thousands of books that come out every year about the Holocaust. And so I kept thinking that somebody was going to write faster than I do. Um, but you can see from a lot of these books that, that first they take a much longer view of the history than I do. I'm, I'm specifically focused really towards the end of the war um, when America has information and is doing something about it. You can see from a lot of these titles that um, you could see the arguments. So the Jews were expendable, the abandonment of the Jews, why we watched, while six million died. Um, this one, accomplices, I think is, is a little bit of an overstatement. Um, but a lot of these books take, like I said, a much longer view of the history, and they contribute to the memory that we have of American response to the Holocaust is this unchanging narrative arc of anti-Semitism and indifference. So the greatest generation won the war as it goes, and afterwards we discovered the Holocaust. So a lot of times when I, when I speak, a lot of people either think the U.S. knew everything about the Holocaust and didn't do anything about it, or we knew nothing until liberation, but even if we had known, we wouldn't do anything about it. And neither of those are quite right. Um, and the establishment of the War Refugee Board is really a hard right turn in the narrative. The U.S. had no policy about the Holocaust, no intention to rescue anybody until 1944, when it fundamentally changes. And so one of my arguments, I think, is that if we forget that this happened, we lose the ability to learn from it, we lose the ability to figure out why it happened, um, and so we also lose the ability to, to figure out how we could do it again, and sooner, to intervene in atrocities as we see them happening. There's another kind of more basic reason that I think nobody's really touched the story of the War Refugee Board before and why this might be the first time you're hearing about it. And that is the original archival records of the board. Um, they are at the FDR library in Hyde Park, New York. Um, it's about 120 boxes of, of documents. Um, and it's, it's in two different series. There's a correspondence series that's about 60, doc or 60 boxes and a project series that's also about 60 boxes. And what I found when I started going through them is that it, where something is, where some document or some report is, really just depends on what the secretary was thinking that day in 1944 when she filed it. There is no other real organization to it. Um, so something could be about like me coming to Kansas City to speak. It could be under like B for book talks under the project series. It could be under E for Erbelding, my last name, in the correspondence series. It could really be almost anywhere. And nobody had really taken the time to go through the whole thing. So the historians who had written about the board had just found like a couple folders marked something interesting and then written the story based on what they saw just in those folders, not in the whole collection. So to reconstruct what the board did, what the staff knew and when they knew it, how a project in one area influenced other, other things. Um, I had to really copy the whole thing. Um, I spent about two years photographing the entire collection and then I reordered it. I, I took all of those photographs that I had made and I put them in chronological order. So I printed all of these documents to PDF. Um, I kept the folders. And I gave each PDF this complicated title structure that you can see on the screen, I hope. So it starts with 1944-06-21, WRB, eight F11, D179. And what that tells me is that this PDF was, is a document that was written in 1944 on June the 21st. 
that I found it in the War Refugee Board Records Real 8 Folder 11, and it's the 179th document in the folder. So I know exactly where I got it, but when you put what ended up being about 43,000 PDFs in one folder, they sort chronologically. And so I could read through from the beginning exactly what the War Refugee Board was doing on what day, where and when, um, they found out different pieces of information. And when you're talking about rescue, especially, you need to be looking at chronology. You need to be looking at what's happening where and when, um, especially in 1944, because the, the war fundamentally changes in 1944, and it absolutely affects what can happen in regards to rescue. So the Nazis invade Hungary in March 1944, and the War Refugee Board panics and starts focusing on Hungary. Um, the Allies land in Normandy on June 6, 1944, which fundamentally changes the way that Americans are approaching rescue for Jews in France, stuck in France. And so all of these things really matter. Um, and if you're just looking at something marked France um, and not looking at the chronology, you don't understand the difference between something that's happening in November and something that's happening in February, right? And so you can see, I put this all in this complicated database and then I added um, you know a kind of summary I could see the document in this database I could assign an author to it I could put in keywords um, all of this became searchable and so I could be really clear on no the war refugee board never corresponded with this person or yes this is the first time that the word Auschwitz shows up in their documents doesn't matter what folder it was in I could tell the first day that this happened. Um, and I could avoid hindsight. That is the historian's trap. The historian's trap is saying, I know that something's going to happen and I will project it onto what I think people should have known before it happened. Um, so when I was reading through, I didn't have that and I knew that they didn't have that either. So what did the War Refugee Board do? What is in the document? Um, they try so many different things and, and so many different projects in so many different places that it's really hard um, without making it sound like a laundry list to kind of summarize what they're doing. Um, so the very first thing that they do, I'll say, is that the day that they're created in January 1944, the first thing they do is streamline how humanitarian aid organizations like HIAS, like the Joint, like the Quakers, like... Um, the World Jewish Congress, how they're sending humanitarian aid to Europe. So by the end of the war, the War Refugee Board has authorized about $11 million worth of humanitarian aid, most of it aimed to Jews in Europe. Um, that's the equivalent of about $154 million today. And that is sent to a host of aid agencies. Um, the money ends up being used to buy guns for the French underground. It's used to buy food for children who are in hiding. It's used to um, pay off guards who are helping Jews escape over the borders into neutral areas. Um, and it's used to create false papers for Jews who are trying to live as Christians out openly. The board also appoints representatives in um, most of the neutral nations in Europe, in Turkey, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Portugal. Um, they have somebody in North Africa. They eventually have somebody in London. And those people's jobs really is to put pressure on the neutral nations and say, you've been playing at both sides for the entire war. You've been playing nice and trading with the Nazis. You've been being, playing nice and trading with the allies. It's clear that we are going to win. And this is something we care about and we want you to care about it too. So they put pressure on these, gun, these countries to allow Jews to escape over their borders saying the US will pay for them and support them if you let them in. Um, they pressured them to protest what the Nazis were doing, and they pressured them to pass on intelligence, pass on what are their diplomats seeing inside Nazi territory. Um, and so they're leveraging this near certainty of allied victory to convince the neutral nations that it's in their best interest to join with the United States on this project. So from Washington, John Paley, who you can see here on the right of the screen, um, the head of the War Refugee Board, he lays out his strategy. His strategy for this is that the um, War Refugee Board will try to persuade the Nazis and their collaborators to stop the killing, and they will try to save as many people as possible. Seems easy. 
but they will try to move people from the margins of Nazi territory, from places like France or places like um, Bulgaria or Romania. They'll take them to safety in neutral areas or for people deep inside Nazi territory, in Poland, in Hungary, they're going to try to keep these people alive as long as possible. Keep them alive, hopefully long enough to be liberated. So I'm gonna give you a quick example of, of one of each of those things. One of the first things they do after they streamline all the humanitarian aid is they start a propaganda warfare project. They record radio broadcasts that are sent into Nazi territory. They, send, they write leaflets that are dropped onto Nazi and collaborating territory. Um, really warning would-be perpetrators that the Allies are going to win. Why would you participate in atrocities? Why would you participate um, in any of these things? So when the Nazis invade Hungary in March 1944, like I said, the War Refugee Board panics about that. Um, Hungary had the largest and last mostly intact Jewish population in Europe. There are about 800,000 Jews still in Hungary. Um, and the War Refugee Board adds a paragraph um, to the leaflet that you see here, the statement by Roosevelt. And they say in this, in this leaflet, as a result of the events of the last few days, hundreds of thousands of Jews who while living under persecution had at least found a haven from death in Hungary and the Balkans are now threatened with annihilation. And they warn Hungarians and Romanians and say, why, why would you decide to be a war criminal at this late date? It is not in your best interest. Um, one of the blackest crimes, this is how it starts, one of the blackest crimes in history, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe goes on unabated every hour. Um, I, I stumbled on this leaflet in part because I read all about, you know, as I was going through the records, all about how the War Refugee Board wrote it and, and FDR looked at it and then agreed that it could go out under his signature. Um, but also because um, I, met up with a German man who remembered finding this leaflet in a potato field in Germany. Um, he was a teenager, a member of the Hitler Youth, and American propaganda was really smart. American propaganda all, often had um, reports of local bombing raids on one side of the document. So you on the ground obviously know that, yes, the Allies did hit that factory in my town. And on the other side would be something like this. And so he said, well, I knew everything else in the leaflet was true. And so this is how I learned about the Holocaust and he believed what he read. Um, so the US government through the War Refugee Board also laundered money to help refugees to sneak into Sweden. Um, I, I've spoken a couple of times at the Treasury Department now. It, it will not surprise you that they like this story. They, they're the heroes of this story. Um, it reflects very well on their history. Um, and I. One of the last times I, I gave a public lecture there, um, one, of the, one of the PR people took me aside beforehand and said, just for this talk, maybe don't call it money laundering. <laughs> and I said, why? And they said, well, maybe just like, could you, could you maybe just call it um, secret financial transfers? <laughs> And I said, okay, well, fine, secret financial transfers, but it's money laundering. And I, I will show you that it's money laundering. So this is Ivor Olson, who you see on this screen, this, this kind of happy looking man. Um, Ivor Olson was the Treasury Department's financial attache uh, to the Stockholm legation, which sounds like a very boring job, um, except that he's also an OSS spy. So precursor to the CIA, his code name was Crispin. And he was in charge of monitoring the movement of money and war material between Sweden and Nazi Germany. So his secret job is actually very important. And when he takes on the role of the War Refugee Board representative, he actually now has three full-time jobs um, and loses about 20 pounds in the first six months of 1944 just from stress. Among a lot of other things, this isn't the money laundering story, but among a lot of other things, he is the one who, who um, recruits Raoul Wallenberg the famous Swedish businessman who goes to Hungary in the summer of 1944. Um, many people don't know that that is why Sweden sends Wallenberg to Hungary. It is at the request of the War Refugee Board. Um, Wallenberg and Ivor Olsen worked in the same building and may have run into each other in the elevator. And so that is one of the reasons that, that Raoul Wallenberg gets to Hungary. And as you know, saves 
thousands of lives in Budapest. Um, that, like I said, is not the money laundering story. So for most of the summer of 1944, though, Olson is focused on trying to get refugees out of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia by water. So there are partisan underground groups for each of these countries operating out of Sweden. And Olson says if, if he can get $50,000, he will give that money, he will divvy it up between the different groups, and they will use the money to buy boats and guns, speedboats and guns, and they will take those across this, the water, land in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and get refugees out. And Olsen thinks that he can get somewhere between six and 700 refugees out of each of these countries. Um, it is very important to him that the Swedish government not know that we're doing this. And it's kind of important to the US government too, because we don't want Sweden to know that the United States is, is funding unregulated refugee entry into their country. Um, and Olsen writes to the War Refugee Board in Washington that Swedish Jews, um, quote, are very interested in Jewish rescue and relief operations, so long as they do not involve bringing refugees to Sweden. So Swedish Jews are sympathetic, but like the United States, do not want more refugees uh, than they've already taken. So the War Refugee Board staff who had worked in US sanctions and had worked in you know, trying to keep American businesses from getting money into Nazi territory, decide they're gonna sneak their money into Sweden. So John Paley, the head of the War Refugee Board, contacts the staff at Goodyear Tire in Akron, Ohio, and tells them that we, the US government, are going to put $50,000 on the books of the Goodyear Tire factory in Akron. And in exchange, Goodyear Tire needs to provide Ivor Olson with $50,000 worth of Swedish kroner uh, to distribute to the partisan groups. There is no reference to this Goodyear Tire deal in any of the War Refugee Board papers, not in any of the 120 boxes. It is almost certain that they scrubbed the records. Um, but like I said, Henry Morgenthau was an excellent record keeper and an excellent manager, and they forgot to scrub his records. So when I was going through all of the War Refugee Board papers, I found this document in Morgenthau's. And so you can see it says, this is from Olson, um, to the War Refugee Board in Washington. It says, this arrangement worked well, and although not foolproof, it's desirable from a security point of view. At this time, we do not recommend bank transfers as receipt of cable transfers of such size by individuals involved in operations unavoidably attract notice and suspicion. Um, it doesn't seem like uh, Olson got six to 700 people out. He actually got about 4,000 people out of those countries. Um, as far as we know, none of them are Jews for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that the Jewish communities in those countries, unfortunately, were, were mainly gone by that point in 1944. And the Jews who did remain in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia had been in hiding, many of them for years, and were understandably kind of nervous about this idea of emerging from hiding, making it to a beach, boarding a speedboat and then trying to get to an island off the coast of Sweden. And so they were content to just wait and be liberated by the Russians. So it is very possible that some of the people the War Refugee Board got out and got into um, Sweden were actually escaping the Soviets more than they were escaping the Nazis. And the War Refugee Board didn't really ask very many questions about it. Um, the last story I'm going to tell really in depth is, um, this is Roswell McClelland again. So the the same guy from the beginning who is watching deportations from France begin um, in Switzerland, which is entirely surrounded by Nazi territory, the war refugee board needed somebody on the inside. They couldn't send somebody there to be their representative. Um, and in the fall of 1944, McClelland had escaped to Switzerland with his pregnant wife, um, planning to wait out the war there and work for the Quakers inside Switzerland. So they recruit him. He is now 30 years old, um, and among a myriad of other things, he participates in ransom negotiations with the Nazis. The Nazis are looking around and seeing kind of the same landscape as everybody else, that the Allies are probably going to win the war. And so a group of high-ranking Nazis decide, well, maybe we can get something. If the, if the Americans care about the fate of the Jews, maybe we can get something for them. And so they offer Jews for sale. Um, the U.S. is never going to pay ransom 
but McClellan and Sally Meyer, who was the Joints representative in Switzerland, they managed to string along a group of high-ranking Nazis for about seven months, um, saying that the U.S. is going to pay. We just need to cross some T's, dot some I's. Um, we need one more list of the things that you want, and we will be good to go. Um, in November 1944, as negotiations start to go south, as the Nazis start to suspect that maybe the U.S. is just stringing them along, McClellan actually goes to a hotel in the big banking district in Zurich, and in the basement of the hotel, he meets with SS Oberstrom von Führer Kurt Becker, who is dressed in an SS uniform. Becker reports directly to Adolf Eichmann, and McClellan says that he is the personal representative of President Roosevelt, um, sent there to express the president's personal interest in the fate of the negotiations. Um, he does not tell Washington that he does this. It doesn't come out until after the war that he's done it. Um, but as a result of that meeting and of these negotiations, um, McClellan and Meyer managed to get 1,600 Jews out of Bergen-Belsen as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis. They're sent into Sweden. Um, beyond all of these things that I've already talked about, the War Refugee Board opens a refugee camp in upstate New York. They bring about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to a town called Oswego, um, a camp called Fort Ontario. And um, they are there in part to put pressure on other neutral nations to take in Jews. So the US was saying, we can't be hypocrites here. We have to show that we too are willing to bring Jewish refugees into our country. So they open this camp in upstate New York um, where you know, they bring a thousand Jewish, mainly Jewish refugees, but they surround them with barbed wire. And it's not until December 1945 when President Truman announces that these refugees will be allowed to stay. Until then, they're constantly under threat of being sent back to Europe once the war is over. Um, the War Refugee Board sends 300,000 food packages into concentration camps in the final weeks of the war. So if you've ever heard a survivor give testimony about receiving a food package, um, it was almost certainly shipped on Long Island uh, or packed on Long Island, shipped across the Atlantic to, to Switzerland, disguised as a Red Cross package, and then distributed to, to Dachau, to Ravensbrück, to Sachsenhausen um, in the final weeks of the war. Um, the War Refugee Board also distributed for the first time information to Americans about the process of arrival and selection and gassing at Auschwitz. They received this report um, in the early part of November 1944 um, that was written by two escapees from Auschwitz detailing in, in very graphic detail um, this process of what happens at Auschwitz with, with specific names, with an estimation of more than 1.7 million people killed at Auschwitz, which we now know is too high, but this is the estimation at the time. And the War Refugee Board, without asking anybody else in the U.S. government, which gets them in trouble, but anyone else in the U.S. government, um, they decide to release it to the press. Um, and it is front page news Thanksgiving weekend, 1944. Uh, this is the Louisville Courier, and you can see that they have reproduced some of the maps, and they have put the font small to fit as much of this report for their readers as possible. Um, it, it is the first time that most Americans read about Auschwitz. It's the first time they read about gassing. And a week after this report comes out, the Washington Post issues an editorial entitled Genocide. It is the first time that word is used in an American newspaper, and it is used specifically in relation to the story of Auschwitz and the fact that the War Refugee Board, a government agency, has just told Americans that this is all happening. Um, so it, in conclusion, really, the War, the War Refugee Board's creation was and remains the only time the US government ever tried to do anything like this. It's the only time we create a government agency dedicated to saving the lives of civilians that are being murdered by a wartime enemy. And this effort, these 21 months between January 1944, when the board is created, and September 1945, when it shuts down, I think really represent this moment in American history when our rhetoric about our democratic values matches the actions that we're taking. Um, in contrast to a lot of subsequent human rights efforts or refugee efforts, there's no second motive. There's no, um, it's not for Cold War intelligence, it's not a propaganda thing. There's no effort to make the Jews that were rescuing American citizens. Most Americans don't want them here. Um, and so it, it is specifically to keep them alive. Um, 
Yehuda Bauer, who's a historian or was a historian, he's, he's um, emeritus now at Yad Vashem in, in Jerusalem wrote once, what made the WRB such a unique body is that it was officially permitted to break practically every important law of a nation at war in the name of outraged humanity. And I hope that the War Refugee Board will start to enter our public narrative of American response to the Holocaust, because I think it's really relevant history. I think that the, the things that they're debating back in 1944 and 1945 are still things we debate today. So how to bring in refugees when they're very real national security concerns, um, the push and pull between we have this finite amount of resources, do we use it to provide, provide relief for a lot of people or do we try to rescue a few people? Um, how do you deal with ransom negotiations with the enemy? Um, how do you keep the, uh, the enemy from getting resources that you're sending into their territory? Um, while the US could have done and should have done much more and much earlier to deal with the Holocaust, especially in the 1930s, what the War Refugee Board staff did mattered. And, and I think it's important to keep this as part of our narrative of the Holocaust to honor their efforts, but also because I think we can really learn from them as we continue to confront a lot of the same challenges today. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And if you have any questions at all, Jessica is gonna help me deal with questions um, about this history or about really anything related to American response. I mean, please feel free to ask. So at this point, we would invite you to chat us any questions you have. One we have so far, Rebecca, is, um, can you tell us a little bit about how your work has been received because your conclusions are slightly more positive than what we've been taught historically? The thing is like, I, I have gotten that before and I don't know that that's true. I mean, David Wyman who wrote um, the famous Abandonment of the Jews, which was a bestseller in 1984. I mean, I have it, I have it right here. It's, it's meticulously researched. He has a whole section on the War Refugee Board, but because the title of the book is The Abandonment of the Jews. I think we have this narrative of the US as this unbroken, like I said, narrative arc. And in reality, it changes. Um, I think it's also really problematic to say that America did something. The US government does things, but Americans don't ever agree about anything. Um, there are people screaming from the rooftops in 1933 that we need to be doing something. And so, if we say America was indifferent, America was anti-Semitic, we erase the people who are doing the work and are on the right side of this history. And so I think illuminating them doesn't, doesn't diminish the fact that we should have done more. Um, but I think it highlights an example that we can learn from. And an echo, like I said, if we ignore the fact that the War Refugee Board existed, then we don't have that to pull from to say that we could do more now, or we could do more later, or they could have done more earlier. It, it shows that it, it was possible, you know? Okay, another question we've received is about the role of um, FDR. Mm -hmm. uh, and how you, having done this research, evaluate his decision-making and his legacy. So FDR is a politician. FDR is not a humanitarian. Um, and he, I think you can look at almost every decision that he makes as president through the lens of politics, because that's how he looked at them. Um, he takes some small efforts, normally when he doesn't, and always actually, when he doesn't think it will hurt him politically. So there are a few small efforts that he makes after Kristallnacht, for example, in, in 1938. But if you look at where he is in his presidency, it's right after the midterm elections of his second term and he has not yet decided to run again for office. So when he says, you know, we're gonna withdraw our ambassador and Jews who are here on visitor's visas, who are here on tourists, uh, on tourist visas can stay. Um, he doesn't think that will hurt him politically. He's as far away from an election as he'll ever be and doesn't think he's gonna run again yet. And so he's willing to do these small things, but only through the lens of politics. Eleanor is your humanitarian. FDR is your politician. In terms of the War Refugee Board, I think he saw this as a way to do a lot of things, um, a way to get Congress off his back because the activists were trying to pressure him through Congress, to get the activists to be quiet, to get to kind of quell this kind of uprising within his administration. I don't know whether he thought it was going to be what it was, 
Um, the Treasury Department certainly means what they're doing. I mean, the Treasury Department takes this on and runs with it as, and pushes as much power as they have. Um, they take advantage of this. But I don't know, and FDR doesn't really give us any clues as to whether he thought this was a real effort, whether he was personally actually very sympathetic to it. Um, one of the other challenges with the FDR is he doesn't live to write memoirs. He doesn't keep diaries. And so historians are always arguing amongst ourselves about why FDR did this or that, and, and there's really no good answer for it. We're getting a lot of questions now. Um, the next one's about President Truman, and when mm -hmm. he made the decision to allow refugees to stay, was there a public backlash to that decision? He does it really smartly, I think. Um, it's right before Christmas. It's December 1945. And there had been a huge wave of public support for at least the refugees at Fort Ontario, at least this 1,000 refugees. Um, there was a lot of publicity about them when they arrived. It was in Life magazine. And there was a lot of sympathy for them when it looked like they were going to be sent back. Um, you know, they, they have, there's like, nice propaganda things that the fort does to kind of convince Congress to allow them to stay or put pressure on Congress, including having the Boy Scout troop of the refugee, like from the refugee camp testify to Congress about like what good Americans they're going to be. And so it was this big kind of propaganda move to, to put pressure on the government to allow them to stay. Um, he also says that he wants Congress to move on displaced persons, but he doesn't think they will, which he's right about. And so what he will do is, is prioritize displaced persons within the quota system. So until the DP Act in 1948, um, it's just that people who are displaced by the war get priority, but they still are subjected to the same immigration quotas in the 19, since the 1920s. Um, he, does not, he does not and cannot change them himself. And so there isn't a huge public backlash because the overall numbers of people he's letting in don't really change. We have two or three different questions about the St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could just address that globally. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I get a lot of questions about the St. Louis. So the St. Louis is, is a really interesting thing. It is an anomaly. It is the only ship that is turned back from the United States. And it's turned back for a couple of reasons. One is that it's not actually aimed at the United States. Um, we did some research, or the Holocaust Museum did some research for our current exhibit to figure out how many refugee ships came to the US, looking to see, are there other ships that were turned away? And what we found is that between March 1938 and October 1941, which is when Germany made immigration illegal from its territory, um, there are about 1,200 ships bringing people who self-identified as Jewish refugees into New York, just into New York. Um, 1,200 ships, about 111,000 Jewish refugees arrive in New York. Um, the St. Louis sails in, in May 1939, so it sails before the outbreak of war. And the refugees on that ship, about 900, 937, I believe, um, are aimed at Cuba. They are on the waiting list to come to the United States, so they don't have immigration visas that you needed to get to the United States. Um, but they're going to wait in Cuba. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's out of Nazi territory. It's a place where about 8,000 people had, had found refuge at the beginning of 1939. It made a lot of sense for people to go wait there. And Cuba um, was experiencing a wave of anti-Semitism at the time, um, in part because of the 8,000 new arrivals, and because the Cuban government had just discovered that, um, that there was a corrupt official who was selling permits to come to Cuba. And so what happens is as the St. Louis is on its way over, the Cuban government cancels all of the permits that this man had issued, including ones for the vast majority of the passengers on the St. Louis. So when the ship arrives, um, despite lots of different interventions, the Cuban government refuses to honor the permits, even though these people were already here. So instead of heading back towards Europe, the ship goes up towards Miami. Um, and there's a lot of press about this. Americans petition the government, uh, the US government, to let them in. And the US government says, we can't make an exception. We cannot, um, it would, there's no visas available 
for the rest of this year. Um, the, the quota year is kind of like a fiscal year, so it ended in June and the number of visas had already run out. Um, FDR is busy with the King and Queen of England, that's when they're visiting. And so a lot of things are happening and the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee gets involved and arranges with the governments of the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Great Britain to allow the passengers to land there instead. So this is actually a huge propaganda win in the summer of 1939. The joint even makes a video about what a great job they've done with, this, with the St. Louis. There's a party on board the ship. We're not going back to Nazi Germany. What we know now, of course, is that within a year, Nazi Germany will invade three of those countries and that the refugees who had found haven there will once again be under Nazi threat. Um, so we know now that about a third of the passengers on the St. Louis are murdered in the Holocaust. About two thirds of them survive either in Great Britain or because they manage to get to the United States or they survive in hiding. And so it is a really complicated story, um, but an but a absolutely fascinating one and one that shows that um, the US, at least and especially in the 1930s, was really subscribing to the letter of the law and not, um, the government was not um, a humanitarian one, I would say. Oh. Not willing to make an exception. We have several questions and we, I apologize, we won't get to them all, we'll do one more. Um, can you speak to the decision about not bombing tracks mm -hmm. and Auschwitz? Yeah, I'll try to be fast, I'm sorry, I know I'm long-winded. Um, so the War Refugee Board is really um, kind of involved in that. So the first request comes in the spring of 1944 um, as the war, and it comes through the War Refugee Board, uh, one of the Jewish organizations in the U.S., uh, sends the request saying, can you bomb the rail lines leading to Auschwitz? And the War Refugee Board, one of the only kind of restrictions that they had um, in their executive order establishing them is that they can't interfere with the war effort. They also don't have planes. And so they pass this request on to the War Department and the War Department responds in June 1944 and says, this is not our priority. This is not, um, we don't have the equipment, they say, we don't have the manpower, we're not going to do it. Um, this comes up again a couple of times in the summer and then in the fall. Once the War Refugee Board gets the report on Auschwitz in November, they actually tell the War Department, we think you should do this. Instead of just passing on the request, here's this report, read this, tell me we can't do it. Tell me we can't disrupt the rail lines or the gas chambers or the crematorium. We have to, we have to um, take, as they call it, direct bombing action to stop what is happening there. And John McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War, once again says, this is not our priority. The best thing we can do is just win the war as soon as possible. And the War Refugee Board drops it. I don't know if they had petitioned more, if they would have done it or could have done it. Um, it seems very, and, and as far as historians can tell, the War Department never looks into it. Um, we know now that there were planes flying over Auschwitz hitting Birkenau, or hitting Buna, I'm sorry. And some of those bombs actually hit Birkenau. So technically the U.S. does bomb Auschwitz. We just bomb it by accident. Um, and, uh, but we never, we never attempt to take out the rail lines or take out the gas chambers or crematoria unfortunately. I'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight and I'd like to thank Dr. Belding for sticking with us and <laughs> trying so many times to come back and deliver this presentation. Um, so thank you so much from all of us in Kansas City. And uh, thank you. Have a great evening everyone. <laughs>